not as eating. And most of us would say that food comes from a farm, somewhere. Wendell Berry writes that eating is an agricultural act, and eating ends the annual drama of the food economy that begins with planting and birth. I knew these words. I studied and experienced them as a gastronomy student in Italy. But Wendell Berry's words got me thinking when I got home and first looked at the landscape around me. Rows and rows of corn, soybeans, wheat, fast food chains, and supermarkets. How did that food landscape connect us to agriculture? I felt sure that if I explored my native South Carolina a bit more, I'd discover more than meets the eye. So I set off on a journey to meet some of the fine people who grow food, sell it, eat it, prepare it, and sing its praises. I wanted to learn more about how eating could be an agricultural act, and I got more than I bargained for. We sold our first egg here nine years ago. Now Keith Willoughby is a fixture at a few of the local farmers markets I visit, and I always get my farm fresh eggs from him. So I asked to see his farming philosophy in action at Wilmore Farms in Lugoff. Over the years we've developed, um, in our minds, four principles that we have to work from um, and that we can't compromise on. And one is it's good for the animal. The next is it good for the environment. Is it good for the farmer? And then the fourth thing, and, and none of these are any particular order, they all are, are equally important. Um, is it good for the community slash consumer? Our main enterprise is poultry. Right. Okay, eggs and, and meat. And then we use the goats, the cows, the sheep um, to eat the benefits mm -hmm. of the poultry litter. Mm -hmm. You know, all the grass that we get. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's at an enterprise that we could add another product that we could raise humanely and distribute without adding capital cost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all puns intended, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, right. so that way you diversify your enterprise. And our houses aren't fixed. Um, they get moved at least twice a week. So, mobile chicken houses. Mobile chicken houses. So that way we are spreading their chicken litter. They're getting fresh grass, fresh bugs. Um, but most importantly for them is we're breaking their parasite cycle. So this is the show we've been told that we're waiting for. These chickens are really excited to move to fresh green grass. Can't you hear their excitement? Here I saw a farm where nothing went to waste. The grass fed the animals, and the animals fed the grass, and Keith and his family were able to sustainably harvest from this system for the market. My next stop was Paxton McGee's farm up in Chira, and after just a few minutes with him, I realized that signature hat marked a Renaissance cowboy. This is Tammy. Yeah. They're closely related to the wild thing. Yeah, the boar. Yeah, yeah. because it, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> these are considered a bacon breed, but it's a lot different than what most people would think pigs would be. I mean, raised properly, they can be clean animals. I use the animals more as a tool. I, I kind of like to steer away from the word landscape because I know they speak of landscaping a lot in some of the books I've read. Right. But I don't look at it as landscaping because then that's our idea. I'm trying to work with nature. Mm -hmm. And by working with nature, utilizing the species that would have been here with the great herds pre-European. Okay. And, and, and trying to work with the different ecosystems that we have in place in this, um, what they call upland woodlands, yeah. and even the beaver pond areas, mm -hmm. and, and having that, working with those, you know, those weren't excluded to any animals. They had free roam to the whole right. habitat. What was different then was the predator animals mm -hmm. kept these herds moving.
But this was a beaver pond, but it's kind of grown back up a little more than I wanted. And we'll look at it from the other side. Okay. Alan Savory, he talks about that in Africa, that the hoof action on these banks, if you can get them rounded off, the grass will go right down to the water. Because these steep banks, as you see the erosion, that's still erosion. Mm -hmm. This rock bed that you see here is natural. So and without the animal activity, the large animal activity, to round those banks off so the grass grows. Mm -hmm. Just like in the wildlife movies on uh, ETV, they, they show the water buffalo and the antelope and all trying to find the shallow areas to cross. Right. As we rested there, I could see how Paxton was using his herd to restore this land and stream. And I saw him, like Keith, working hand in hand with nature. I had heard that Alvin Pear had a true farm to table approach to food. After visiting, I learned that when he sees his crops growing, taste and variety are always on his mind. Okra, beans, peas, bell pepper, squash, cucumbers, watermelon, now, my dad was back in the uh, in the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. He had farms. Okay. And I don't know how. I, I just love to see things grow and materialize. Okay. So I think it just in my blood too. So it's, right. it's there, and I think it's there to stay. Mm -hmm. I think it's there to stay. Good. Yeah, I got no intention of quitting. <laughs> yeah. Are there any that are ready to come up? Yes. Yeah. Oh, they're so pretty. This is the, this is the perfect size that yeah. that people love to have put in the, on a little pot of cabbage mm -hmm. or string beans, or either some people just want to take the whole potato, clean it, yeah, and just put it in the pot and steam it, and just eat the whole potato. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she do the okra potty first. I try to pick it separate, and she will have that in that corner, that in that corner, that in that corner, and she come and put it all together. Goodness. And come back with some dry cooked rice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could hurt yourself. <laughs> I mean, so um. I first met Joe and Amanda as a volunteer on their farm in Blythewood for a local farm tour. Dogo Farms is where they live out their conservation and food ethic, and this is a real unique place that we can all learn from. Traditionally, I'm a conservation geneticist by training. Mm -hmm. I always find a lot of security in diversity. You know, when you go out to a forest or, you know, the ocean, you don't want to see a monoculture, right? You want to see diversity because that indicates a, a healthy ecosystem. You know, if something happens to a particular breed, they're susceptible to, say, you know, a disease or an outbreak and you lose them all, you better have a backup and you need to have some genetic diversity. Same thing with like corn. I mean, all our corn is number two. And it, you've got to have diversity in the food system. And it, it, it you know, boils down to food security as well. So you, you really have to think about that. Aldo Leopold said it best, you know, when you lose a species, it's gone. You, you don't get it back. We want to raise our animals on pasture for a variety of reasons. It's better for the environment, it's better um, quality meat, it's a better humane lifestyle for the animal, it's better working conditions for the farmer, no doubt. I do not want to be in like a chicken, a poultry house with like a thousand to five thousand birds yeah. to do my morning chores. And then we've selected heritage breeds um, because they're the best suited to make the most of what the pasture has to offer. They're breeds that um, were developed before the Industrial Revolution, before mm -hmm. like the um, mid-1900s. Heritage breeds are animals that can run, fly, mate on their own, another thing I do not need to be involved in, and um, get a lot of their diet from foraging on pasture. The guinea hog is a small heritage breed. It's a lard type of pig. They used to be the most numerous pig in the southeast. They were on virtually every homestead. They were kept in yards to clear out snakes, kept in orchards to clean up windfall fruit. These guys are market weight and they're um, nine months old or a little bit better at this point. So you're not getting a huge pig for your nine months, but what you are getting is a lot of flavor. If you're looking to learn more about food security, then Ray Kenner is where you should start. Ray's been saving seeds since he was nine, 
and mirrors Soko's preservation ethic, but with plants. It was in 41 when President Roosevelt would have his fireside chats. And he, this was during the Second World War as it started. He wanted everybody to plant uh, a victory garden. Uh, I planted six seeds originally. And I learned to save those seeds my cousins and my great granddad had given me. All I knew about heirloom, I had heard our relatives talk of old furniture, and that was their heirloom. Right. That, that's all I knew. Uh -huh. But then we had the understanding later of uh, the heirloom was even a passed down seed. And uh, many of my relatives had seeds that they exchanged and passed down. Nobody ever bought a seed. People gave seeds, like exchanged seeds. You would use your seed from last year's planting to replant your new garden. Mm -hmm. So this is a pure green glaze from when you were a boy. Yeah, oh yeah. Everybody had them in their backyards. This grows just like a hedge. Okay. <laughs> There's no changing this color. You have to keep it pure. Right. Yeah. And it tastes altogether different from most colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 it, it is different. Mm. So we learned to save our seeds, which of course we did over the years, and and we developed a seed bank, a very large bank. One of the reasons I I know that I save seeds, uh, uh, there could be any catastrophe. To, to come. A disease could hit. You could wake up one morning and the whole system is just fallen in, the, in nature. Mm -hmm. if, unless you had seeds to, to replace it, we would not know how to, how to live. You can't feed the world. People have to learn to feed themselves. These incredible folks taught me a thing or two about being a farmer in these parts. And for letting me come visit, I offered to help out. Now that's what I call food from scratch. Huh? Yeah, I, I can do this. You, if you make that, you go deep in the ground. Now you don't okay. have to go deep. Let, let her take a time and you do it. Do, 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 a lot of the older okay. people who did little small gardening, that's what they always at you. Yeah. I think it's pretty straight. What do you think? How am I doing this? I'm just doing a little farming. I want to keep this twisted up like this. Uh huh. And then you want to okay. roll it off onto your shoulder. You can hold that in. Okay. Okay, I got it. Wait, that's been done? Now I have to pour it in there? Is it so oh, good? Oh, oh. There we go. You did a much better job than I did. Did you hear that? <laughs> Aaron, this is probably going to be the best one for you to pull. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right, are you ready? So I just, I just pull? Yeah. It's a little harder than you think. It'd take a long time to get the food from the field to the kitchen at the rate I was going. But seriously, our local food system really is broken. Only 10% of our food is grown inside of the state. That just doesn't make any sense. If we want a vibrant local food and farming community, we got to support it. Right. And it just can't be with words. It's got to be, like Robin says, you know, you got to vote for it with your dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and we understand it's every family struggles, but we are beginning to see more and more are transitioning over to, okay, we can, we can take some more of our disposable income and put it in our food budget. 
if that's the one thing I can drill in folks' heads is, is you gotta buy local because when all hits the fan for natural disasters or, or military disasters or political disasters, if you don't have it available locally, you're not gonna have it. And the only way we're gonna have it is if we're creating the band now. The good news is that you can help change the industrial food system by the way you eat and by knowing your farmers. You won't find any label at the supermarket with the kind of information you get from Alvin and Paxton about the food they've raised themselves. And see, I, I be trying, I'm the one that take it to the market too. So okay. I mean, you know, between the market and the farm, that can be full time. Because if you can tell them what it is and what it does, a lot of times you can get that sale. I get labeled sometimes as one of the best sales it is uh -huh. because I can tell that story of it. People say, I never eat none taste like this and they'll be going to the store to try to get some of that same taste, but it never meets it. But if it came from California or Florida or something like that, it been picked, shipped, and about two weeks to three weeks old. I mean, straight from the garden, straight to the kitchen, it's a different taste, I promise you. <laughs> it's a different taste. I like hearing the feedback the customer gives me. It gives me encouragement. Mm -hmm. We cooked sausage, um, chops, and I'm gonna do some ribs. Oh, the one, the neck? That was good. Oh yeah, that yes. was good. That's better than the pork chops. <laughs> and, and my husband's right. like, oh, but there's wow. only one neck in every pig. <laughs> <laughs> or else, or else we can make more of that. But it's good. Good stuff. We're happy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people like seeing pictures of, you know, this is the pig, that, this is the mama, the, you know, the pig that you ate. And I can show them and they get to see how those animals were raised. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is my backyard. How do you like my backyard? Really? Yeah. And those really? Are kids? That's my daughter, and she was supposed to be here today, but she had car trouble, so she couldn't make it. My son works at a horse farm, and he still helps me some. Really? So, yeah. So, and this is Tammy. She was the mother of all the pigs I have now. Started with one pig two years ago. Wow. And now I have a hundred and some. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And where the cows are, if, if the rest of the picture was there, my house is like ten foot away from them. They were literally in the backyard where we took that picture. And the customer likes meeting the person who grew that animal. And this is all grass fed, grass finished, never fed any grain, no chemicals at all, was born on the farm, as well as all the pigs are born on the farm. So it never leaves the farm until it goes to the packaging plant, which is a USDA facility in King Street, South Carolina, and there's their USDA stamp. Their name is there, Williamsburg Packing, along with my name. So we're taking responsibility, doing the it properly. Houses are in South Carolina too. South Carolina. This, these animals never left the state of South Carolina. Well, I got the sixty for you. All right. So I owe you four dollars. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm trying to get somebody help with the. Vet. So if we start drawing away from that, we're getting back to a commercial type system. Because I got discouraged trying to sell here locally in Toronto, and they like, your prices are higher than the grocery store. I says, and do you get to meet your farmer at the grocery store? I met a local food ambassador in Wanda who puts her money where her mouth is. I think it's 32, and it's a five. I didn't bring, that's what I didn't pack more change with me today. I started shopping here, I'm going to say past five years. Okay. Five years. And what and, triggered that decision? Yeah. And that was part of me just gradually changing my diet. All your greens are still your spring and your summer greens. Yeah, we're, so it's kind of our in between seasons. In between right seasons. Now. Okay, okay. Just eating better. I just kept tweaking, always adjusting the diet. Mm -hmm. What can I include or exclude you know, from my diet or put in more moderation that just to, to feel healthier? Your microgreens, let's see which one I have not had. I think I've had them all. <laughs> <laughs> we have some basil microgreens coming up too. And they should be at Saturday morning. How about the sunflower? I'll take a sunflower please. Sounds good. Yes, thank you. If I can purchase and know that the foods that I purchase are locally grown, pretty much in the state of South Carolina, I am all about, to the best of my ability, trying to support 
those farmers and those providers. Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just a good thing. How do we make more Wandas and create that demand? We can look toward the low country with working solutions like the state's first food hub and incubator farm as a model for revitalizing the local food system. South Carolina in general has a strong sense of place and Charlestonians especially are very proud of where they're from and I think that um, that's helped influence the local movement. Charleston has a huge history in agriculture right. and a lot of it was commodity based farming, uh, specifically tomatoes, and when that collapsed People were shifting into diversified vegetables for farm stands and for farmers markets. And it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, you know, mm -hmm. a great way for the community as a whole to get connected with local vegetables. In some ways, that tomato market and the collapse of that tomato market shaped how we grow food here. People are just very proud of where they're from, they're proud of local food, um, they're proud of their farmers. And so I think that that has kind of cultivated this, this community of people that are very um, supportive of farming, they're very uh, protective of their farmers, they're very passionate about eating local food. So now you have a culture of, of individuals, of businesses that have access, easy access to all this produce, mm -hmm. and the farmers are willing to give it to them. So here's this amazing demand and the farmers are kind of getting it and then the farmers are aging out. So we're talking, right. you know, the average age being 59 yep. in Charleston. So they're retiring out who's going to grow all this food? We're creating all this demand and now we, may, we have to make sure we have a supply. My father had to quit farming because his father lost the entire farm kind of due to uh, commercial farming when everything back in the 50s they all went to the large you know, bigger equipment, yeah. less labor in the field, and so a couple bad years and he lost everything. Farming is going to be a lost art in America if we don't wake up and do something about it, especially the small farmer. It's scary. My biggest fear is that there won't be a person in the next generation to continue doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting any younger. It's it's taking a toll on me. A year plan, I don't think they came in with the 2025 or 2030, we here may not have a supply of food to feed ourselves here. So if we don't start shadowing some young kids to be able to maybe become, to be a grower or either a farmer, we could be in terrible trouble. And we can't depend on other states or country to grow food for us and we, we got access to everything the land the condition of the weather and the knowledge and all we did is pass the knowledge on down to somebody else but there's hope well the south carolina new beginning farm program has been uh, around for three years the program was uh, supported by a usda beginning farmer rancher development program grant that allowed us to both put on a program that had a lot of educational content as well as some really applied kind of components in the form of internships and mentorships, working with some partners. Uh, Low Country Local First was one of those partners and uh, Carolina Farm Stewardship Association was another uh, key partner there as well. And both of those organizations ran the internship programs uh, as subcontractors under our program. I ran into Jan at Wilmore Farms, a former computer programmer who is making a big career change. So I began to realize that really what I'd really want, like to do is not be stuck in a cubicle all day, but I'd really just like to be on a farm, and this is just heaven to me. Okay. <laughs> so now I've graduated eight months later, and I have a business plan. I'm actually wanting to do mob grazing with cows. That's what I want to do, and I'm just, cool. I cannot wait. <laughs> yeah. Our future farmers seem to come from unusual places. Chris opted out of his corporate job to follow his passion. I was running out of things to be proud of. I started thinking more and more about where's our food actually coming from? Why are we asking people to work hard for their money and then come give us that money and then I can't tell them anything about where their food is coming from, who's growing their food. That in a lot of ways is what is has kind of taken me from the corporate restaurant world and brought me into farming. It's, I just want to take responsibility for my life 
So I just want to eat good. I want to have good, strong community. I want a good, strong family. I want to do something that I absolutely believe in. Chris also happens to manage the teaching plot at Dirtworks, South Carolina's first incubator farm. Our program, um, like I said, has started since 2010. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning of the program till now, we've pushed um, over 80 apprentices through the program. Okay. And then out of that program, um, starting in 2012, we launched the incubator farm. The incubator farm is there to provide um, some low risk, easy access opportunities for new beginning farmers. Okay. So they're leasing an acre to two acres. But with that acre comes a tractor, a packing facility, hand tools, and a farm mentor. So it's, it's more than just you know, that land. We're really trying to give them business incubation. So it's, we want them to have at least three years of farming on record with sales. But a big reason we chose that three-year marker is because that three years is how long you have to have documentation of farming to be able to secure a lot of government loans. The mutual alliance between farmer and chef has been around since the beginning of restaurants and is a vital way to build a local food network. Take a look at why Chef Tim Peters from Columbia buys local. I, I guess the main reason I do this is when I first started working in Charleston, uh, I worked for Mike Lotta and he started buying all this produce from Celeste Albers and um, oh, another farmer, I can't quite recall his name right now. But anything they had, we would buy. And when I came to Columbia, I just ended up going with the unbelievably small farmer. And we have this great little symbiotic relationship. When they have something, I buy as much as I possibly can and find a way to use it. So, Harvest Week's right around the corner. What you guys got? <laughs> well, I just saw three little boar guinea hogs that would like to go on a one-way trip to King's Tree. I, I think so, I can accommodate. I was going to put his hat on so he wouldn't get cold when I'm in the freezer. <laughs> How many boars are in that litter? Four or five? I think five. You could take all the boars. So they're, they're pretty small right now? Uh, we, we can go see me if you want. Yeah. Um, they're, shoot, I don't know, 80 pounds? So it dress would be like 50? Probably. Awesome. Yeah. Well, do, should we take a look at them and see what size they are? And if, if they're big enough, we can take them in like next week, week after, and have them processed. But if they're not big enough, we can keep them a little bit longer. And yeah, let's get them up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it kind of <coughs> Yeah. Here's Boo Boo. The one on the left? Uh, the he's starting to get a little cape in the front. <laughs> They're like banana loaf size. There's a little chunky one. <laughs> Look at him. My menu changes every day, twice a day. I have it set up where I can use anything almost anybody brings me. I, I think that's really my job, um, is sitting there and continually growing and using the things that people bring me versus having a set menu. I have certain relationships with almost gardeners that they'll go to the farmer's market or they'll have something and they'll show up and they might have 15 pounds of tomatoes. Perfect. Yeah. I can buy it. My menu changes daily. I have it set up where I can use anything almost anybody brings me. I, I guess it reminded me of my time in France and the farmer would show up and bring these beautiful heads of lettuce and these incredible tomatoes. It, it was just so fresh and so local. I mean, this is eight miles from the restaurant. Exactly. You can grow so much in so little of a space and just have it be absolutely fantastic. And great pepper, awesome texture, just unbelievable. And variety. What could you ask for more? Who wants monoculture? Throughout my journey, I saw Wendell Berry's words taking shape all around me. Food, farming, and community are inextricably linked, 
evidence through the people I met and the stories they shared. Eating, as much as it is an agricultural act, is also a celebration that can be as simple as a family meal. If you go to Webster and you look up agriculture in the dictionary, you know, it's a compound word. Okay? So it's just not ag business yeah. or agribusiness. Okay? It's agriculture. Mm -hmm. So when we look at it strictly as a business model, we've forgotten the culture. Yeah. Um, we wanted to do something that would be honoring to the family's history, mm -hmm. but we had to do it in such a way that was good, holistic, that mm -hmm. was beneficial. That's part of who we are and what we wanted to be is a farm that would help people to understand where their food's coming from. Food throughout the whole time of mankind has been a very important part of the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the one of the glues to the community. You know, that makes that community what it is. Along with its faith, its belief system, food is right there with it. If you could make a new law or eliminate an existing law, what would it, you do? Well, this could get real political real fast. <laughs> We've forgotten that mm -hmm. in, in agribusiness. And returning back to agriculture, you know, again, what's good for the animal, good for the farmer, the environment, and for the yeah. community. That starts to bring that agriculture back.